Well, good evening and welcome to our service here at Libanus Church. We hope that you will feel welcome and we hope that you will feel blessed this evening. Whether it's your first time or your 400th time, we hope that you will be presented with Jesus, that you will see him and know him. Well, my only two announcements are to just say that the Pray for Morrison streets are available on the website. So if you want to pray with us as a church for the streets in Morriston, please do go onto the website to find them. And then just to thank uh, Avion Perkins from Ponte de la Nova Church, just for coming and bringing us God's word this evening. I'm sure we, sure we will be blessed as we come and as we think about what Avion has for us. Shall we pray now this evening? Father, we just ask now that you would bless us. We ask that you would be with us. We ask that the service would be for you. We pray that you would be glorified from it. Father, use this to point us to Jesus. Encourage us in the Lord. Build us up. If we are weak and needy, if we need help, be with us, we pray. Help us now to concentrate on you. Amen. Well, our first hymn this evening is God Sent His Son.
The reading this evening is taken from Hebrews chapter 1 and starting at verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Well, as we come to a time of prayer, we're first going to have a very short song played for us. We're going to play the doxology, which reminds us of the God to whom we pray. Because the God that we pray to is nothing like us. He is so far removed, so far beyond us. So as we come and as we focus our minds for prayer, let's sing together the doxology. Praise Well, what a great reminder of who God is. Now that we've been reminded of who he is, shall we pray to him? We come to you now, Lord, and we acknowledge that you are Father, Spirit and Son. We thank you for the triune power of yourself. We thank you that you are the God of all, that you are Lord of all, that you are sovereign over all. We thank you that nothing distracts from you. Nothing is able to overcome or overpower or overshadow you. But we thank you that you are supreme, that you are above all. And we thank you, Lord, for the reality of that in our lives. We thank you that because you are God, because you are Lord, we can depend on you every second, every moment of the day. We can trust you. We can follow you. You are faithful, you are just and you are good. We pray, Lord, that we we might come to know in a deeper way, in a greater way, the power of Jesus Christ, the love of Jesus Christ. And we pray now for this sermon as Ivion comes and opens up your word. We ask that you would preach, that you would speak. As Ivion uh, speaks, Lord, we pray that he might speak with authority and with power from on high. Be with him, we ask. We pray, Lord, that the words would have great power, effectual power. We pray it would take hold of our lives. We pray we would never be the same again because Christ has been presented, because Christ has captivated us, because Christ has taken control. Father, we just ask that there would be power as Jesus is proclaimed. Power in the name of him. Power by his blood. Power by the cross. Power through the resurrection. We are so blessed to have a God who has done so much for us, who has given so much for us. And we pray that this evening, wherever we're watching this video, however we're watching this video, we pray that we might be reminded that we might be lifted up and directed to the cross. Father, take us to the cross of Jesus. Remind us of what you've done for us. Whatever our needs, 
whatever our situation, whatever ills or pains or problems we're facing, whatever is going to happen on Monday morning, we pray that we will be well fed today. We pray that we will be prepared through what we hear. We pray that we would be encouraged to hold on to you in the good times, in the difficult times, in the struggles. We pray, Lord, that we might hold on to you and never let go. We pray, Lord, for those who are unable to watch online. We pray for those who are feeling lonely or isolated. Lord, we know the list of members and friends who are getting older, who are getting ill, who have got scans and health appointments. We know that list is getting bigger and bigger. But Lord, we know that your love far exceeds any need. That your faithfulness, that your grace, that your kindness, Lord, we know it is bigger and greater than anything, any need, any problem that we could possibly have. Father, in every situation, be faithful, be good, have mercy on your people, we pray, and minister to our hearts this evening. Amen. Well, before Avion comes and opens up God's word, we're going to sing, My Heart is Full of Thankfulness. look at the first few verses of the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is a great book. It goes through many of the Old Testament truths and applies them to New Testament people. It goes through the things that happened and the things that God did and the things that God said to the people of old and shows us, shows the church, the church in Jerusalem, the importance of those things and what we need to learn from those things. And the opening verses of the book give us the background to that. They give us a description of where this book is going. It's titled in the Bible that I have before me, The Supremacy of God's Son. 
and in some ways I, I would argue that that is the title not just of this section but of the whole of the book of Hebrews how when you look at what happened in the Old Testament how you look at these Old Testament heroes you see that they actually are a pale image a small type of what the Lord Jesus Christ is and this book as well as all scripture in reality lifts up the Lord Jesus Christ the Son of God God in the flesh for us to see him and for us to learn to look to him looking to Jesus the author and finisher of our faith as we read in this book we are encouraged to look to him and as we come to these opening verses we get told how God has described and shown these things to us get that word God spoke and that's something that, that we're familiar with isn't it speaking we all do it it's the the way that we communicate with each other we interact one with another by speaking that's what I'm doing now is I'm speaking and you are hearing what is being said we often think of speaking as the words coming out of my mouth and you hearing them but the truth is is that there's a lot more to speaking than just the word said there's the person saying it there's the person that they're saying it to there's the tone of how they're saying it there's the context of how they're saying it you can ask a question what are you doing and it can be an inquisitive question out of interest of, of what that person is doing at that specific time because maybe you've never seen someone doing that before or it can be said in a different way what are you doing which is an accusation where you think that they're doing something wrong and so how things are spoken changes the extent sometimes of what is meant by those words and so as we come to look at this passage we need to consider first the God who is speaking and we need to take that as, as a background really to how we look at scripture the God who speaks and then we need to look at the way that he speaks or, or the mode of speaking that he uses and then we need to look at what he says the words that he has spoken to us you need to know who's speaking you need to know the context of the person that's talking to you and that's what we have in the opening part here long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers God spoke and there's a lot of things that we learn just from that sentence the first thing that we see is that God has revealed himself in order that he may be found now my children haven't quite grasped this especially my daughter she's a little bit younger but when you play hide and seek you're meant to stay quiet because when you're hiding you don't want someone to find you if you start speaking well inevitably they go in to find you because they can hear the noise and they can follow that noise to where you are and so when we see these words God spoke it starts off with giving us something that we need to realize about God that he is revealing himself he wants to be found it's interesting isn't it that we as people are inquisitive we have a whole store of questions the other thing that my children constantly do is ask me why 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 and they do that because they're interested because they want to know the reasoning behind what we're doing they want to know who we're doing it with they want to know when we're doing it how many sleeps are there until this point and we're inquisitive aren't we as people and God has created us in that way and isn't that amazing that God reveals himself or wants to reveal himself and has made the people that he's made and people that he wants to reveal himself to be inquisitive 
But saying that, people still reject to see God being revealed. They still choose to blind their eyes. Yes, they've had their eyes blind by the prince of the power of the air, by the devil, who veils and masks our eyes so that we can't see the truth about God. Can't see the truth about ourselves either. And when we think of the questions that people ask, questions like, how did we come to be here? What happens to us when we die? Great, deep questions. Where can we find those answers? Well, we can find it in the word of God because God has spoken. Because God has revealed them to us. Because what God wants us to know, God wants us to see. Why do we reject those things? Well, God has actually explained that to us as well. Because the word of God tells us that we're sinful. And so although we're inquisitive, there are certain things that we don't like. And the basis of sin is rejecting God, rejecting what he deserves and questioning his perfection and his glory. And so because we're sinful, because we've got that as part of us, then we struggle with God revealing himself to us. We choose to see other things and refuse the true answer because we're uncomfortable with the concept of God. But what we get told here is that God has spoken throughout time, long ago. The truth is, is, is from the beginning God spoke. The truth is that there is only a beginning because God did speak. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. God spoke, let there be light. That's why we exist, because God spoke. And we have a record of, of, of God speaking. And it gives us a bit of a context of, of why he speaks, because he's made us. And that's a, that's a really important truth for us to grasp. God has created us and has spoken because he wants us to know him. He wants us to know who he is. He wants us to enjoy fellowship with him. It's amazing, isn't it? That God created us to interact with himself. To know him. Isn't that great? That he wants us to react and speak to him god speaks so that we those who he has created can hear he's given us ears to hear and eyes to see what he has done what he has said and that's a great lesson for us to begin with that god wants us to know Paul in his letters often writes, I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers. And that's why he writes what he writes. And God's the same. God tells us and speaks to us because he wants us to know. He deals with us because he wants us to understand. If you don't want to have a conversation with someone, you don't speak. My, master, my father is the master of this art. If he's in a room filled with people and he doesn't feel like speaking, he'll sit in the corner silent and he'll fade into the background. But God hasn't done that. He hasn't just sat back and disappeared in the background. He's spoken. Spoken throughout history. The fact that we're still going is because he speaks. He continues to speak life into this world so that's the first thing that we see is that god wants to have fellowship with us he wants us to interact with him the second thing that we see is that he continues to speak and the fact that he continues to speak in these last days he has spoken reminds us that he hasn't given up on that 
Though we're sinful, though we reject the idea of God, reject the perfection of God in our attitudes, in the way that we do things, in the way that we sin, God still hasn't given up on us because he still speaks. I'm here speaking the word of God. I am reading what he has written in his word and expressing what is said here for you now, here, to hear, to listen to. And that's good news because it means that God still wants to say the same thing. He still wants to communicate the same message that he always has done. He wants us to hear. He doesn't want this to roam around confused. He's created us for a purpose of knowing him and engaging with him and having a relationship with him. And I suppose that's the first thing that we need to deal with when we come to the word of God, that we need to believe there is a God. And we need to believe that there is a God who wants us to hear. That he wants us to understand our situation. Surely, if we've been created, our creator would want us to understand our situation. He wouldn't stay silent, would he? And so that's what we see here. As we think of the God who speaks, he speaks because he wants us to hear. He doesn't want us to grow up around in darkness with regards to some of these great questions. Well, having said that the God speaks, how has he gone about doing that? What is the means of his speaking to us? How has he conversed with us? Well, he's conversed with us and to our fathers, the ones who have gone before us, by the prophets by his messengers. He's communicated through other men. Yes, we hear of instances where God does speak personally and audibly to people in the scripture. But the message re re reached the general population by means of others who communicated that word. Those who spoke directly to the Lord. We hear of Moses, for example, don't we, that the Moses spoke to God, one to one, face to face, as it were. And that he then passed the message that God had given on to the people of Israel. He wrote down what he said, so that we, even in our day and generation, can read those things that were said. Those things that God said to him. That's what scripture is, isn't it? It's a recording, a written recording of what God said to the prophets. As I'm speaking to you, uh, I've got my notes in front of me. I have a written word before me to help me remember what I intend to say and to, to keep the train of thought of what I'm trying to say. So that what I'm saying makes more sense than if I was depending solely on my memory, which though I'm relatively young, is still imperfect uh, to communicate what God's word says. And God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. He speaks to men through men. He speaks to us in a way that we can understand. He doesn't speak to everyone, everywhere, at the same time, though he could do. He speaks to us gradually. If you look at the things that we read in the scripture, the information that is there builds on what has already been said. We have that in normal dialogue, don't we? And in normal stories. Information is gradually given. Firstly, you tell people about the people that you're talking about. If I have a conversation with one of you, I would probably start by saying about whom 
I'm speaking about. And then if I gauge from your reaction that you don't really know that person, I might go on and elaborate as to who that person is and give more of information about that person until you know who that person is. And then what I'm going to say about that person makes sense. And that's what we have in scripture. And that's how, what we have in, in the revelation that God has given of himself. He tells us information and then he builds on that information. First thing that we see in scripture is that he is the creator God. And this is a vital truth that he made you and me and that he made us in his image. But he goes on from there because he tells us of the fall where we've sinned, where we've lost that relationship with him. Where that, that fellowship, that friendship, that walking together with the Lord in the cool of the night, where that gone broken. And then the scripture goes on to explain how it will be restored. And gradually the information about the Saviour gets built on. One comment to Adam and Eve, then a little bit more said to um, those who come after them, to Abraham, to Moses, to David, and so forth, until we have the full picture of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And God spoke at many times and in many ways through the prophets. Some of the prophets did some strange things. Um, people of the 20th century uh, think that drama in churches is a new thing they obviously haven't read the book of Ezekiel because Ezekiel acts out things for the people to see he acts out pictures and he does statues and um, builds things of clay so that the people can see what God is saying to them as well as hear it and so God speaks in many different ways at many different times to many different people and gradually he unfolds the whole message to them and what we see is that he unfolds his message to them fullest by his son but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son who he appointed the heir of all things through whom also he created the world he's spoken to us through jesus christ he's spoken to us through the savior yes he's spoken through the prophets and there are great great things that we can learn from the old testament jesus himself used the old testament to speak to the two people as he walked on the road to Emmaus to show them things relating to him the scriptures speak of me he says all scripture speaks of me but in the last days and the book of hebrews was written some 30 or so years after the lord jesus christ walked on this earth so they were very recent days for them they spoke through him and the history of jesus christ the words that he said the way that he said it people that he said it to the context all of that was there for them to read and to understand and it's there for us to read and it's there for us to understand and he spoke he spoke and this is maybe the most glorious thing that God not only spoke through people to us but that in the fullness of time he spoke through his son who became a man to us and that's incredible isn't it not only has he not given up on us that he still speaks to us but what he has to say to us it's such importance that he was willing to send his son to speak it to us so that he would communicate directly to us as a glorious part of the Trinity, that he would communicate the will of God, the message of God to us as people. Why not speak to everyone at the same time? Well, we have 
the record of God dealing with the people of Israel in the time of Moses. He came down on the mountain and he spoke and his voice thundered and the people were petrified. The people couldn't deal with God speaking in that way. So they asked and they wanted someone to represent them. And so Moses did. And God understands that if he speaks in his fullness, that we couldn't cope. So he spoke to us through the prophets and through his son. And his son shows us and tells us everything that we need to know about God. He tells us everything that we need to know about him. Gives us the context of what he's like. Gives us a, a description of how he is. Shows us how he is because he's God in the flesh. And that is how he speaks to us. He speaks to us through his word, through the prophets, and through his son. And these things we have recorded for us in the word of God, in scripture. So that we can look to scripture to see what he has to say. When we have a question that comes to our mind, we go to the word of God where we, we can find the answer. Seek him while he may be found. He is the one who gives all the answers. So that's how he's spoken to us. He's spoken to us through the prophets. He's spoken to us through his son. He's spoken to us in ways that we can understand, that ways, in ways that we can recognise, in human words. But what has he spoken to us? What has he said to us? What information has God passed on to us? Well, there's a few things here that we have. And the first thing that we see that God communicates to us or speaks to us is his own glory. When we get a description of the Lord Jesus Christ, yeah, the one from whom all the world was created, we get told that he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus Christ is the perfect copy of the Lord himself, of God himself. He is identical to him in personality and character. The glorious things that are true of God the Father are to be seen in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see it. You can hear it. So what is the glory of God? What is true of him? Well, part of it we've already heard. Through whom also he created the world. Jesus Christ is the creator. And we see the radiance of God's glory in that. Because he is the creator. He is the one who made all things. And we see the power of the Lord Jesus Christ as he was on earth over creation, don't we? We see his authority, that when he spoke, even the winds and the waves would listen to him. He has control over nature. He has authority over the rules of creation. He, by his word, even raised Lazarus from the dead. That's the glory that the Lord Jesus Christ has. That's the glory that God has. Power creative power, authority over creation. It is incredible that these are the things that we hear. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. That's the first thing that God speaks to us about. Speaks to us about himself. Seek, speaks to us about his eternal being so it speaks to us 
about his almighty power, speaks to us of his strength and authority, speaks to us of who he is in and of himself, that he is perfect, that he is self-existent, that he is not dependent on anything, that he is utterly self-sufficient, that he is able to do abundantly more than we can think or even imagine. These things are impossible with men, but all things are possible with God. And Jesus came to show us that, came to show us the glory of God, the wonder of his person, the majesty, the awesomeness. And he came to do that so that we would desire to know him, so that we would want to be with him so that we would want to have the fellowship that once God and man had in its beauty in the Garden of Eden, before sin, before we corrupted ourselves. And so the first thing that we see that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke and the prophet spoke was of the glory of the person and the character of God great God himself. But not only does he want us to know about the great character of God, he wants us to know about the way that we can come to him. We've spoken about sin already, haven't we? We've spoken of the fact that we don't have the relationship that we used to have with God. That that fellowship, that that friendship, that that beautiful communication that there once was, was broken by sin, by our sin. Because we didn't think that God was in us, foolishly. But the other thing that, that Jesus teaches us, and the other thing that the prophets teach us, is that there is purification for sins. That there is a way of dealing with the things that keep us away from God. It's really funny when people read the word of God because they want to know God. They start really well. They read the book of Genesis because they start at the beginning because that's generally where you start a book. And they read it and, and, and it's great. The way that God shows his glory, the way that God protects, the way that God creates, the way that God does great things. And, and, and people are even happy as you go through Exodus, that the God saves and that, that he does amazing things. And then you get to the second half of Exodus and people start to lose interest because of all the rules and the regulations and the temple and the sacrifices. And they don't like that. And they find it difficult and they persevere through Exodus and then they find that there's another whole book going on about the same things. And they think to themselves, I've gone through half of this already. Do I really need to read this again? To some extent, they're happy with the glory of God. They're happy with something of the amazing nature of who he is but when it comes to dealing with what had to be done to, to purge our sins when it comes to looking at what had to happen to make us right with him we struggle with that the message of the purification for sin is difficult for us to take we don't like the idea of, of a substitute being sacrificed in our place. Because that makes us feel, well, I couldn't do it myself. It makes us feel weak, dependent, needy. But we are. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ needed to make purification for sins, because we're sinners. Because we're unrighteous, because we're unholy, because we're, we're failures. And so although the glory of God is appealing to us, and although having a, a relationship with him and, and this idea of heaven that we have is, is, is always pleasing, and people like the idea of heaven, 
They grasp it for themselves, even though they don't understand that they need purification for, from sins for it. They like it. Wouldn't it be great with God, the perfect one? Wow. Wouldn't it be great to be in the perfect place? Of course it would. Of course it would. And God shows us his perfection and his glory. So then we go, I want to be there. I want to be with him. But God also tells us that we can't attain that by ourselves. We need forgiveness. We need our sins purged. And we don't like that, do we? It's not a message that always pleases us. <laughs> it runs, it's one that certainly cuts across our pride. But what God says to us is, look, I am the glorious one. I'm the wonderful one. And you can have a relationship with me. But you need to have your sins purged. You need to be purified. And Jesus Christ did that. He made purification for our sins. He paid the price on the cross. And after he paid the price on the cross, he sat at the right hand of the majesty on high. It's amazing, isn't it? Jesus did what was necessary. He could say on the cross, it is finished. And then he rose from the grave to show that he conquered the grave and to, to be the trailblazer for all those who would follow him. And then he ascended into heaven again, showing what would happen to those who trust in him, that they would go to be with him where he is, to be with the Father, to enjoy heaven, to enjoy the glory of God's person. He did all that for us. That's the message that he has for us. And then we have this word, having become as much superior to the angels as the name that he has inherited, inherited is more excellent than theirs. And that's why Jesus is the name that we honour. And Jesus is the name that we pray, praise. And it's interesting, isn't it, that we start there, having become as much superior to the angels. Why does it say that? Because when Jesus Christ became a man, he took on the form of flesh. And as flesh, we are a little bit lower than the angels. And so Christ took on flesh and took on the appearance of one who was less than the angels. Even though he's their creator, the one that they worship. And he did it so that he could save us. So that he could bring this message to us. Showing us the glory of God and showing us the way to come to him. No wonder he's the one that has the greatest name. No wonder that it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we must believe to be saved. God spoke and he still speaks and he says to us, Look at me. Look at the way that I've created this world. Look at the way that I've created you. Look at my power. Look at my authority. Look at the way that I sustain you. Look at how you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Look at my glory. Look at my perfection. Look at my wonderfulness. Look at my love. Look at my grace. Look at my mercy. Again, these things come through to us in what Jesus Christ was like. Look at all these things. Look at all my character. Don't you want to be with me? Don't you want to spend time with me? You can. You can in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we draw to close looking at these few simple verses, do you want to be with God? Do you want to spend time with the glorious God who created the heavens and the earth? Do you want to spend time with the eternal one, the perfect one, forever? If you do, then you can. That's what he's saying to you. 
That's what he wants you to know. That's what he wants me to know. If I'm feeling downcast, if I'm struggling with circumstances, he wants me to look up to him. Think of what he is like. Think of who he is. And remind me that he wants me to be with him. That he wants me to be with him so much so that he sent his only begotten son so that whoever believed in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. Isn't that what we need to hear? That the great God loves me, even me. What a, what a great message we have. What a great saviour we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great message the Bible is. Even the tough bits, they show us that we can be purged of our sins. And yes, it's complicated. Yeah, it is. Can we delve into the depths of the glory and the wonder of what happened on the cross? Well, we can scratch the surface, yes. But know fully what it costs. Oof. Such amazing things. Well, I pray that that's an encouragement for each and every one of us. That God spoke, and that he still speaks. And that his message is one of, look at me. I am the great God. And come to me through my son, the Saviour. Amen. Amen.